Welcome to West End. We are so grateful to see you here today. Before we go any farther, why don't you just take a few minutes to say hi to the people around you. We are not here out of obligation. We're not here out of ritual. We are here because we have a God that calls us into worship. God has gathered us here today, so we bring our whole selves. We bring our goodness. We bring our brokenness. We bring our joys and our sadness. We bring our apathy, our hopes, and our fears. And in the midst of our own stories, we gather here to find God's story. A God who welcomes us. A God who welcomes all of us without condition and beyond measure. So we gather and we worship. So join us as we worship the God who draws us here together. Amen. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings, yeah you were, yeah you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things, angels.
disappear, and I can say I still don't like it. Um, I'm glad to see you all this morning, though. But hey, today I just want to share a little bit. First, I'll tell, for those who don't know me, my name is Sue Melema, and I'm the Kids Hope Director here. Kids Hope is a program that is nationwide, and we partner with a local school. So the school West End partners with is Shawmet, which is just a few blocks away. And with that, we have this year 18 mentors who show up every week and spend time one-on-one -on -one with a student. And it, we've seen a lot of changes in the last two years with school being closed and us not allowed in last year. I know it's been hard for some of the mentors coming in this year with changes with their students. So I just want to acknowledge those people. But before I do, I just want to share some of the really cool stories of things that I've seen go on with mentors and students this year. I get a front row seat with that, so I had to write them down so I don't forget. But um, one of them I saw was a mentor who brought in a journal, and she taught the little girl that she meets with every week how to journal so she could write things down. Another one was a mentor who came in with a model airplane so that her student could learn to read better. She made him read the instructions on the model airplane and they put it together a little bit at a time each week. Um, I had another mentor who I would listen to encourage this young boy week after week that no, you're not dumb, no, you're not stupid, we just gotta work on this a little harder. Um, I saw a mentor who every week on her way in would stop and buy her student a banana because he likes bananas. And I thought that was pretty cool to do. And then uh, mentors who stop and they look up stuff about presidents so they can bring in information and they can share it together, things about space travel. And then a mentor who even, one time I came in and they were having this little party because they wanted to celebrate his test scores for reading. So those are all just really cool things to me where mentors put in the time just trying to think of ways to make their student feel special. Um, so there are a bunch of you here today. I would like you to just stand up where you're at so West End Church can acknowledge you. Oh, the mentors. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so. so thank you. And behind every mentor is a prayer partner who is praying for that person and that student week after week. And I thank you for that, too, because that is what holds the glue together with that, um, this program. And then we have the treat makers. We have people who each, every other week, were assigned to bring in a treat, whether they bought it or made it, and that did not go unnoticed. The staff and the teachers really like treats at school, don't they? Yes. So it was always fun to go in there and see what they were all eating and what they were enjoying. So I thank you, too, for that. So if you think about all them things, we have mentors, we have prayer partners, we have treat makers. West End Church just comes together, and we just really, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Just work together to make sure partnered with Shawmet. So now I would like to invite Dr. Maben up. He's here with his family today. Um, he just puts in the time at that school, and I just watch him love on these kids week after week. He truly does care about them. And with it being Principal's Day today, and he knows I keep track of that, I just want to thank you for all you do. So before I, I'll give you a little bit of background about Shawmet, um, and I've got just a few things that I want to say to you, but uh, I, I think that I would regret it if I walked away, if the first thing I didn't say is, Man, praise God for Sue Melma. Uh, I always tell people, you know, I'd, I knew God spoke to my heart and told me what I was supposed to do with my life, and I went in, and I'm, I'm sewing in, and I'm, I'm doing what he told me that I'm supposed to do. Uh, but still, when I grow up, I want to be like Sue Melma. <laughs> like someone who selfishly pours into kids, who encourages other people to serve and to be God's hands and feet. You know what I mean? Sometimes I feel like we need less talkers and more doers. Uh, and Sue is living a life and demonstrating for people what it means to be a doer. So I, I, I would encourage you, let's just take a moment and really celebrate Sue for everything that she does uh, in your church and in this community.
Sue, I love you, and I know that my Shamit staff and my students love you. You are such a blessing to us, and I wanted to thank you so much. So I'll just give you a little bit of background. Um, this is my fifth year at Shamit. Um, like she said, we are a few blocks away, um, which now that we got some news attention on Friday, a few more people know where our school is. Um, we serve this year about 270 students um, from preschool through eighth grade, um, which is a really interesting range of students. Um, I've grown to really love the little ones, the middle size, bigger ones, whoo. My wife, Amy, who's with me today, uh, she loves the middle schoolers, and I am so thankful that God created people to love on middle schoolers, because man, uh, we have a beautifully diverse uh, student body. Um, you know, we have white students and black students and Hispanic students. Uh, about 90% of our student body um, it lives at or below the poverty line, so we have lots of opportunities um, to bless the families and the kids. Um, man, my teaching staff is absolutely top notch. I think pound per pound, I couldn't find a better teaching staff. They love the kids. Um, their hearts are dedicated to the kids, but they have big toolboxes. Uh, we serve kids that have trauma backgrounds. We serve kids uh, who come in and they're already like at the 99th percentile of everything. Like they're just tearing it up and making sure that those kids are, are feeling challenged. So, you know, it, it, it is a diverse and broad range community. Um, but we are doing our best uh, to serve our kids. And I want to tell you, one of the reasons that we're able to do that is because of all the wonderful mentors that come in. Uh, Sue mentioned the boy that uh, constantly sort of degraded himself. Um, you know, I won't mention his name because I don't want to get in trouble, but he came in and I could count on that kid to get suspended four or five times a year for fighting. And I knew as soon as I brought him into the office, he would fabricate the most ridiculous story you've ever heard in your entire life. Had nothing to do with reality, but we kept pouring into him. His mentor kept pouring into him. You know, I'd, every time I'd sit down and I'd listen to his story and I'd be like, all right, bro, none of that happened. <laughs> and then we keep loving on him. And slowly but surely, like, we started to, like, like build his trust. You know, at first you sort of had to prove it. Well, it took a little bit longer than normal for this particular child. But we proved to him, like, dude, we're not going to give up on you. We're going to keep loving you. We're going to keep pushing you. We're going to keep challenging you to do your absolute best. And I have to tell you, like, that particular student uh, is going to go down in history, like, in my career, is one of my ultimate favorites. I will always remember that child. Uh, I can remember even he was having a slump this year. He was taking the PSAT, which, whew. For an eighth grader, it's a lot. And he came in with this, like, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to blow it off. Like, I'm going to have this bad attitude about it. And we confronted him about it. It's like, look, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to everybody who's poured into you to demonstrate your best effort, to do the best that you can. And instead of taking three days to turn him around, to get his mind going back in the other direction, it took about a half an hour. And he did what he was supposed to do and worked his absolute hardest. So... I just, again, I want to thank you for your program. I want to thank the mentors who come in and pour into my students. It's so valuable. I mean, you know, we, we may not always have the opportunity to directly share Jesus with our students, but our lifestyle, like the way that we intentionally sacrifice ourselves to pour into people, um, that shows the world God's love for them. So I just wanted to quickly, like, I'm so thankful for this congregation. If I may, I'm going to pray. Uh, for you, um, and then I will give up this microphone. I know I wasn't supposed to be on this long. So, Father God, thank you for this congregation. Lord, thank you for the people who are willing to be your hands and feet. Father, we thank you that we are known, Lord, because of the way that we love each other, Lord, and the way that we love the world, Lord, that we are the, we are the example, Lord, of Jesus, that many people will have the opportunity to see. Father, so I ask that you continue to use this congregation, whether it's through prayer through direct ministry on students or for providing my wonderful staff treats. Lord, I ask that you'd bless them, Lord, that you'd encourage their hearts, Lord. Father, that this morning, if you're putting pressure on anyone's heart, Lord, to say like, hey, there's an opportunity for you to go into Shawmet and to bless those students, Lord, that they would have the courage to step up and do that. Again, we are so thankful. Shawmet is so thankful for this congregation, Lord, and we just, we lift these things up in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so you can make your way in the back. Um, Dr. Maven, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for all you do for West Side. Last week, Saturday, I brought my kids to their Little League game, and there's Dr. Maven and some of the staff and the superintendent out there landscaping, you know, and so it's a, uh, and I even read a study this past week that just said 49% of teachers and administrators are either looking for a new job in a different school or looking for a new career altogether. It's just a very challenging time to do what you're doing. And so on behalf of the church, thank you, thank your staff, and certainly, Sue, thank you for the way that you invest in them. It's just a beautiful way our church can be the hands and feet of Christ to our neighbors uh, all around us. So thank you very much for being here today. Um, few, quite a few other announcements. Um, First is, for those who are visiting today, you will see in the pews these little connection cards. We'd love to know who you are. Uh, this gives us a little, um, you know, a little feedback of who, you're, who you are and how we can reach out to you. If you are willing to fill this out, just bring this to the Welcome Center in the back. There's a desk over by the elevator. You turn in this card, they'll give you a little bag of goodies. And so um, it's a pretty good trade. And so if you're willing to fill that out, that would be great. Reminder that today we have two offerings. The first one's for the ministries of this church. The second one is for... Faith Promise, um, that's our way we support missionaries both near and far, and so there's boxes in the back as you leave the sanctuary. A um, couple things about prayer. You know, Dr. Maben and Sue talked about the importance of prayer in this ministry, but prayer is just such a central part of this church and our faith in Christ. And so today we're going to mark off a day of 40 days of prayer for our denomination. Our denomination has a big um, meeting that's coming up in June. Just kind of talk about our denomination, the direction it's going. And so we want to be intentional in prayer about this. We see what's happening in the Reformed Church of America. Um, and we see just the division that's, that's, that's just you know, happening over there. And we just want to make sure that we're intentional about prayer, not just for our church, but for our denomination as they make major decisions that are in their future. And so... Um, Arla Thomas might help us put together, and the denomination help us put together uh, ways that we can pray for our church and our denomination. So you'll see those in your church mailbox. And then also this week, Thursday, is the National Day of Prayer. So we're going to keep our church open um, throughout the day, and we invite you to just come at any time and just spend some time in prayer, um, either for those that you love or just offer praises to God. But just let's be focused in on prayer um, both this week and in the weeks to come. Seniors... The deacons are putting together a seniors dinner coming up on May 11. So this is just a great time for fellowship. Um, this is not high school seniors. This is uh, the seniors that have invested. In, and uh, we're just so grateful that we can celebrate our seniors. So that's May 11. But we just do need to know if you're coming or not. So please be sure to fill out an RSVP or let your deacon know that you're coming. Uh, we need to head count hopefully by today if we can. So um, just know that that's coming up. And then just a couple opportunities to fellowship and connect. Um, the first is tonight. We are having just some people get together. We're going to have some pizza. We're going to give kids a chance to go run and play and just give adults a chance to get to know each other a little bit better. And so we know there's lots of new families, but there's still a lot of people have been coming to our church for a long time that just would like to get to know each other at a deeper level. And so we're just going to do that tonight. We're going to keep it pretty simple, but from 5 o'clock till 7 o'clock, we invite you to just come to church. We'll have some pizza and a chance to just connect with one another. And then um, that will lead us into... Um, our church retreat is coming up in uh, three weekends from now. And so we just invite you to come to that. What that is, is that we take as many of you as we can and many of your friends as we can. We go out camping to the campgrounds in Grand Haven called the Christian Reform Conference Grounds. We have plenty of activities for kids, plenty of activities for families, plenty of activities for adults. We just invite you to come and be part of it. We'll be out there on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We will not be here for worship on that Sunday. We'll be worshiping out there together. There are flyers that are over by the Welcome Center. It's just a great time to get to know people in a context that you just can't get in a church or a Sunday morning. So we invite you to check that out and be part of that. And so... Um, and then finally, just want to say thank you to uh, Doug Stapley for sharing last week for at our coffee connections. We just thought that was great. We had plenty of people just gather on the table just to once again an opportunity to get to know people better and see how God has impacted their lives. So Doug and Deb, thank you for your help putting that together. And then we're going to do that again in two weeks on May 15. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to hear uh, Jane Vanderpaul, who I've heard her story. If you've, um, you think you know a person and. 
and then uh, you hear their journey, and it's just, uh, you just love them even more. So we invite you to come and be part of that. So with that, we're going to step into prayer. Just a couple things before we do. Just um, It's in the bulletin, but just for those who didn't get a chance to read that yet, Betty Cooper passed away uh, on Friday, so we want to remember her and her family this week. Um, Deb Hudson had successful surgery this past week. Um, she is still in the hospital recovering. If everything goes well, she'll be released on uh, Monday, but she, and then she's going to go to a rehab center for about two weeks. And so um, definitely a longer surgery than she expected and a longer recovery um, lies ahead. So we just want to keep her and her family in our prayers. And then um, on a much different note, this time next week, my wife Felicia and I will be heading over to Chicago to get on a flight to head out to Israel. And so we get a very cool opportunity to go on an Israel study trip. And so for 11 days, we're going to leave on Mother's Day, um, right around lunchtime, head over to Fairhaven, and then we're going to go. The trip is going to be led by Jeremy Cruz and Wally, and you know who some of you guys know. Alicia and I are very excited about this trip. There is a way to follow along with our journeys. If anyone's interested in doing that, there's a blog that will be kept. And so there's a information on that in the bulletin. Um, but we certainly cherish your prayers for that, and we are pumped. We cannot wait for this opportunity. So um, with that, let's go before God in prayer. God, we just sang how you are a good, good father. It's who you are, and we are loved, and that's who we are. So God, here in this moment, may we re be reminded of your goodness. We wake up today and it finally feels like a spring day. And so God, we give you thanks for that. We know that with spring that brings re new life. We know that there's new hope. And so God, we're grateful for the change in the season finally. And God, we also thank you for a God that, is so, that you are a God who is so consistent. We thank you for the way that you love us. And that we are no more loved today on a good day than we are on a, a day where we're hurting and we're struggling. And so, God, we just thank you for your love that never fails. God, we pray for those who are hurting and struggling today. We walk into your sanctuary and we bring our whole selves, our hurts and our struggles, our joys and our praises. And God, we just bring them all right before you. May we find healing and grace in you and you alone. May you bring healing to our souls at the deepest parts of us. And God, we pray specifically for those who are hurting and struggling today. God, we thank you for the life of Betty Cooper. Just shy of 100 years of faithful service to you. God, we thank you for the way that she invested in this church, that she served in this church. And we just thank you for the life that she lived and we're grateful that she is with you here today in paradise and yet god we pray for her family pray that you grant them comfort in these days god we thank you that the successful surgery of deb hudson we pray that you will grant her strength and healing and restore her to good health and god we pray that you'll be with alicia and i as we get ready to go on this big trip grateful for the opportunities that this brings. And we just pray that this will be one of those unique opportunities where you just open our eyes to see you in a whole new way, in a way that just deepens our faith and our walk with you. God, be with all of us here and now as we open up your word. May your word speak to us. And may we grow more and more in love with you every single moment. Lord, all as we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, West End family. Good to see you all. Thanks, Dr. Maven, for sharing this morning. Uh, I'm in education, too. I teach college students. But it doesn't matter what age your student is, the first step in education, or really anything, is just to care for and love those students. And when they feel that, that's how they grow. That's how they develop. It's as simple as that. And the reason we can do that is because we are loved by an amazing Heavenly Father. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning for a few minutes. So this week, 
I was cleaning up one of our closets at home and I ran across a whole bunch of those family photo albums. We got about 10 or 12 of them stuck in the closet there, you know. For those of you who are under 30, let me explain what those are. They're the <laughs> There's these, there are these book type things that are bound and they have little plastic liners in them. And then, you know, you take your film over to Meyer or Walgreen and they print the pictures. And you take them home and you put them in the plastic liners, you put them in the books and you turn the pages and you look at it. That's what a photo album is. So I ran across these in our closet and I just started looking at them. And it just brought back this feeling of nostalgia as I kind of paged through those photo albums. I kind of felt like Clark Griswold up in the attic. Remember when he looked at those films of his early Christmases and just got all nostalgic because each one of those photos has a story attached to it, right? And I just sat there for a couple hours looking through those things. Wonderful treasures. You do the same thing, right? Our family photo albums are wonderful things. You know, at birth, first birthday, one candle. First day of school, the prom, and then the wedding. So among our photo albums, we have a book for each one of our children. So it was interesting the way we take our photos and how this works. So we, we got, I got out the album with our oldest son. His name is Nathan. And I looked at the photo album. I said, looked at it, and they're all labeled. You know, there's Nathan at birth. There's Nathan at five minutes old. There's Nathan with his first bath in the hospital. There's Nathan coming home from the hospital. There's Nathan arriving back at home. There's Nathan sleeping in his crib for the first, and on and went. Then I got the photo album out for our second son. His name is Michael. There's Michael being born. There's Michael on his first day of school. There's Michael at graduation. <laughs> and then I got the album out for our third son. His name is Ben. And I opened up the book and I looked at it and I went, whoa, what? There's Ben being born. Man, we got to get more pictures of Ben. <laughs> The poor third and fourth child, right? They, he has no pictures of himself. It's always with his brothers. But, but, but those, those are just wonderful treasures, aren't they? Those photo albums, they cement us together and just help us recall the past. Time goes on. Life keeps moving. And one day you're standing in front of church holding your child, presenting him before the Lord, and you blink your eyes. And that child is walking across the stage, graduating from college. And through this miracle of technology, photos, we can, as it were, thumb our nose at time and say, I've captured you right here. And we can carry a little bit of the past along with us on into the future. Photo albums are wonderful treasures. Well, that's what Luke the writer has done in his gospel. He's captured certain photos of Jesus. Now I think many of us have come to realize that the gospels are not exactly biographies. You know, they don't record every moment of every day of Jesus' life in exact chronological order. In other words, the gospels are not videotapes of Jesus' life, but rather Luke snaps a picture here in the manger in Bethlehem. And then he captures a picture there in Nazareth in the carpenter's shop. And then there's another photo of Jesus with the blind man and the leper. And of course, finally, there's a picture of Jesus stretched out on the cross. Luke's photo album of Jesus. So what I want to do with you this morning for just a few moments before we come to this table is to look at one of those pictures that Luke has captured for us. It's a familiar one. It's a picture that Jesus himself drew, obviously not with a camera, but with words. Jesus told stories, we call them parables, and as Jesus told these stories, Luke captures pictures for us to look at. 
So let's look at one of these pictures. You've all seen it before, but may I suggest that there may be a few details in this picture of the man that we call the prodigal son that you may have overlooked, perhaps that you never noticed before. So let's listen to Jesus tell his story, and let's look again at the picture that Luke has captured for us in this scene. It's in Luke chapter 15. Let me invite you to stand where you are and let's honor God as we read His Word together. So Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And that's God's word for us today. You can sit down. So in our photo album, as you page through it, uh, my wife actually, who puts it together, labels the pictures, lest we forget exactly when they were taken or the exact circumstances. And in Luke chapter 15, there are at least three pictures I'd like to show you concerning this rebellious young man. If I were going to label them in the photo album, I would simply put on the first one, sick of home. I would put on the second one, homesick. And I would label the third one, homecoming. Let's look at this photo album of Luke, shall we? And let's look closely at the details of the photos that he provides. So let's focus our attention, first of all, on this one that we label sick of home. Sick of home. There in the picture is this father overflowing with love for his son. His son is restless and the son wants to get away from his father's house. And the son says to his father, Father, give me the property that is due me. Father, give me the property that belongs to me. I want out of here. Now, I've been helped in understanding some of these simple pictures from Jesus' stories uh, by a man by the name of Ken Bailey. He's written a very interesting book. I recommend it to all of you. It's entitled, Seeing Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. 
And as he prepared to write this book and so on, he, 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 he says that he traveled through the villages in the Middle East. And as he did, he brought up this very familiar story. And he asked the people in those villages, he said, would you ever say this to your father? And the answer repeatedly came, no, never, never would I ever say to my father what this boy said to his dad. And Kim Bailey asked, well, he said, have you ever heard anyone say this to their father? Never, they said. I've never heard it. He said, well, well what if you did? I mean, what if you did hear a young man say this to his father? Well, then what would it mean? Oh, came the consistent and repeated answer. It would never be said here in the Middle East in our family villages because it would mean that the boy wished that his father was dead. It means that he had no use for him whatsoever. He only wanted his property. He wanted nothing for his name or his person or the legacy that his father wanted to pass on to him. Now doesn't that add to the rebellion of this boy? He hates his father and he wishes that his dad was dead. Now you need to remember also that this terrible rebellion of this young man is an awesome and terrible thing in light of the villagers as well. Did you notice that what the father gave to his son when he left home was not money? In spite of the picture I have projected here, he didn't give him money. The boy asked for property and that's what the father amazingly gave him. Property? Are you kidding me? Covenant property? Abraham's property? A symbol of the promise that God had made? Land? A place to live out your life? A resources to use in your mission to serve God and bless the world? The land? A sign of God's covenant and family union? He gave it to his son. His son turned it into money and then squandered it, as we read in the text, on wild living. Now what do you think those villagers are going to do now? That covenant property has fallen into the hands of Gentiles. Well again, Ken Bailey helps us and says almost certainly that boy would be judged by the council of the village in absentia. His crimes of wasting property would be listed and he would be excommunicated from the community of believers. Sick of home. Yeah. But he's sick of God too. And he's sick of his father. And he's sick of family. And he's tired of the very thing that we celebrate so much. Our family, our children, the bonds of love and respect and compassion that hold us together. I mean, what a sin. What an awesome rebellion. I mean, there are many problems, of course, in today's youth culture. We're all well aware of them, so am I. Sure, it's bad when young people engage in promiscuous sex or use drugs or alcohol. Of course, it's a blot on family life. But there's something worse. Do you realize that this young man is not just squandering money, living wildly and partying all night long? He thumbed his nose at God, at the family, at the village. He has no use for tradition. He doesn't care at all about God's purpose in his life or living according to biblical values or living up to his redemptive purpose. He lives wholly for himself, completely self-indulgent, immediate gratification. He doesn't care who he hurts in the process. And as we'll come to find out, and as people always find out who live this way, he is in the process of destroying himself. 
what a sad story. What a terrible, rebellious young man. Well, let me carry you along a little bit further in the story and go to our second photograph. Homesick. Can you see him? Sitting in the pig pen? Mud up over his ankles? Pigs slopping all around him? Hungry? Starving? He can't even get enough to eat from the pods that are left over from the pigs? Ironically, this Jewish boy in a foreign Gentile pig pen. How far from home can you get? Look at him. Is he repentant? What do you see in the picture? Does he hang his head in sorrow and repentance for what he's done? I don't think so. No. There's no repentance in the pig pen. It says, if you look carefully at the text in verse 17, it says that he came to his senses. A light went on in his mind and he said to himself, boy, this is dumb. Man, what a stupid thing to do. Leave home where mom does the laundry and there's plenty of food in the fridge and I've got a Netflix subscription and I can do what I want and play video games all day. This was stupid. Why did I end up here in this Gentile pig pen? Boy, did I make a big mistake. And so he makes his little speech. His homesick speech goes like this. Can you see him saying it to himself, practicing, muttering in that Gentile pig pen? He says to himself, yeah, I'll go home. And I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm unworthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. It's as if he's saying to himself, then why don't I go home and see how things are going back at the ranch? You know, I'll, I'll tell Dad I made a big mistake, that I honestly squandered his money, but, but I'll tell him. I'm healthy, I'm strong, I'm young, I can work, I'll try to strike a deal with Dad, I'll become one of the hired servants, and I'll see if I can pay off the debt that I have. What a terrible view of repentance that is. He thinks he can pay back the money. He thinks that will make things all right with his dad. He has no intention whatsoever of healing the hurt of the relationship. Maybe you're familiar with some of the formal standard views of repentance that, that, that sort of go along this line. You know, views of repentance that teach us, yeah, we need to be sorry and we need to grieve for our sin and be sorry about what we've done. We need to do penance for it to make up for it. Reparations before perhaps a priest or a church. You know, we'll go halfway to God. God will come halfway to us. We'll sort of meet in the middle and everything will be okay and we'll be reconciled. Is that the gospel? Is that how repentance works? Oh no, it doesn't. Oh no, folks. There isn't anything that you or I can do to make up for the hurt that we have caused God. Absolutely nothing. Zero. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. I wonder if any of you, I know I have, have been guilty of this kind of selfish arrogance in which you hope to make reparations before God for what you've done. You know, you try to save face. God, I'll be good. Next time, I'll be good. I'll do this and this for you, God. I, I'll never do it again. Thinking that you can do something to get yourself out of this and maybe not look so bad. I'm telling you, that's no repentance at all. Yeah, we need to be sorry and grieve for sin, but not just for the sin, but for the relationship that we have destroyed with God. There's only one thing that you can do, only one, and that is to simply accept His mercy. 
Stop trying. Stop trying to restore that relationship yourself. All you can do is be overwhelmed by His grace and then you realize something of the amazing love of God for wayward sinners such as we are. But now, our final photograph. Because this young man did come home, didn't he? And we have this wonderful picture of the homecoming. Now you have to remember, this picture has been taken with a wide lens and, 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 and you, can, you can see the village and, and maybe the ranch in the background. And then it says, notice, it says that when the father saw him a long way off, when the father saw him a long way off, he had compassion on him. Compassion on him? What for? Is he sick? Is he hurt? Has he contracted leprosy? Is he blind? I mean, why have compassion on this returning rebel? I mean, ordinarily, I might think that a father would just sit in his house, in his chair, and wait for this rebellious son to come in the house and see what he has to say for himself. But no. He has compassion on him. Why? Well, allow me to suggest, although the text doesn't mention it, that he has compassion on him with regard to the villagers. Do you think the people in this village, the neighbors, are looking for this boy to come back? Don't you think they want their land back and their money back? Don't you think that the gathering mob in the street has a punishment for this kid? Oh, they certainly do. But the father has compassion on his son with regard to the neighbors. He feels a tenderness for this boy and he, he, when, as he returns home and he runs out to greet him. You see in the picture the father running. It says he ran to greet him. Now, we need to stop there for a minute because it's clear if you know anything about the culture of the Middle East, a man, a person in flowing robes never runs in public. Obviously, that's different from our culture, right? Many of you like to go running in your neighborhood. We do so in full view of our neighbors and all that. But I'm telling you, that would never happen in Jesus' day. The rabbis taught that a man's manner of walk tells you who he is. Aristotle said, great men never run in public. But this father does. And when he does, you should understand that he doesn't care at all for cultural values or what's expected of him. This thing that would mark him off as being undignified and embarrass him, he doesn't care about it. He abandons all of the customs of the family, of the whole village, and he runs to greet his son. Can you see him with his bare, hairy legs coming out of those long, flowing robes with that aggressive look on his face and his determination to reach that boy before the villagers? Does this man love that boy? He loves him. Nothing will stop him from getting to that boy first. And when he cuts there, he greets him and he doesn't say anything. He just surrounds him with his arms and he repeatedly kisses him. Now, now that's easy to understand, right? Because when we, you know, we greet each other, say goodbye to each other in our culture, we, we, you know, we, we kiss each other or give each other a peck on the cheek or something like that. But I got to tell you, that's not what this father does. The indication in the text the verbal form here that's used is one of continuous action. And it says that if this is what the Father is doing repeatedly. It almost says that, it seems to say that he tackles his boy to the ground and just smothers him with kisses. He's so glad to see him and welcome him home. 
Man, what love he has! His robes flying. The intensity on his face surrounds him with love for this. My son was dead. And now he's alive. He was lost. But now he's found. Now what, what's this boy going to say in the face of all those kisses and his father's determination to get to him? Well, He's got his speech prepared, right? He made it up back in the pig pen. So, here goes. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's it? Nothing else? I mean, young man, what happened to the main phrase? What happened to make me one of your hired servants? It isn't there. It isn't there. You see, now what's money? What's money in the face of such love? You see, the Father's love has triumphed. There is victory for His grace and mercy. And now what was just the prelude to the speech that He made up in the pig pen now becomes the main point. Father, I've sinned against You. I've sinned against Heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called Your Son. And that was the wonderful reconciliation between this Father and His boy. Isn't that a lovely portrait and picture of our Heavenly Father? And His love for all of us? Paul says in Romans 5.8 that God demonstrated His love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, we, we all know something of this kind of family love, don't we? And we celebrated together. We've, we, we held our children in our arms. My wife and I did. We brought them before the Lord. We felt the deep love of a parent for a child. You've done the same thing. You have. Do you think that the father in this story held his little boy in his arms and brought him to be circumcised in the Jewish culture at eight days old? Do you think he did? Sure he did. What love! And that love, that love that he felt at first was stronger than the might and muscle of Samson. And it would not be broken. It would be persistent forever no matter what that young boy had done. Do you feel that way about your children? Yeah, most parents do, right? Most parents do. So, let me ask you, if you feel that way about your children, that no matter what they do as they grow up, you will love them forever, no matter what. How do you think God feels about us? People who have been made in His image, just like our children have been made in the image of their parents. How do you think God feels about us? when we belong to Him, when we first had our existence and then we became rebellious, oh, I'm telling you, God will be persistent. Nothing but nothing will stop Him. And He will smother us with His eternal love. I mean, it's unbelievable. I don't have any more words to explain to you. I have no more words to tell you about God's love. I have no more words. And so God gives us another picture. He gives us another image of His love. He gives us bread and a cup. Images pictures of the Father's love for us. Of His grace. Of His mercy. Of His care. Of His persistence. 
What wondrous love is this? Oh my soul, oh my soul, what wondrous love is this? Broken body, shed blood. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for this picture of Your amazing love. A Father overflowing with love and grace for a wayward son. And Lord, in this picture, we see ourselves because we have wandered. We have rebelled. We have squandered what you have given to us. And so we throw ourselves on your grace and on your mercy and we thank you for your promise. We thank you for your persistent love. We thank you for your arms wide open, ready to embrace us. Lord, smother us. Thank you for adopting us as your sons and daughters. And now feed us at this table as we recall that amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it's appropriate that the reunion between that father and that son ended with a meal. Right? Father said, kill the fattened calf. Get out the best food. Let's have a party. Let's eat and drink. Let's celebrate. The reunion ended with a meal, but the meal wasn't so much to celebrate the return of the child. The meal was to celebrate the love of a father. That's what the meal was about. And so, just as that scene in our story today ended with a meal, I think it's appropriate that today our corporate worship ends with a meal. A meal in celebration of the Father's love for us. Everybody, this is personal. It's broken bread. (laughs) This is personal. This is personal. Have you been to the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C.? We have. And, and, and it's interesting when you're there because there's a difference between tourists and family members. Have you noticed? I mean, tourists walk around like tourists, right? Snapping pictures, talking loudly. Family members approach the wall with respect. They kneel. They trace the name of their lost loved one. Believers approach the communion table differently too. Some come with a tourist mentality. Well, I guess it's communion. Guess we're going overtime today. I guess we'll eat the bread and drink the cup and go home. Others, though, come with a much different attitude because we know the name of the one who gave His life for us. And so we say that when we come to this table, we're going to do whatever it takes to honor the One who laid down His life. So let's come to this table, not as tourists, but as family members, sons and daughters, adopted into that wonderful family, smothered by the love and grace of God. If you want to be embraced by those loving arms, if you want to experience the grace of God, then come to this table. God loves you. And He wants to show you that today. Let's come to the table of our Lord.
today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh come to 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love comes flowing down, covers us, covers us completely. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of Christ was broken to forgive us of all of our sins. Take, drink, remember and believe that the blood of Christ was shed to forgive us of all of our sins. Just stand for God's parting blessing. That amazing love and that amazing grace covers us today. Covers us. We've just celebrated it at this table. And now, as we have been filled with the love of God, let us go forth to share that love with one another, the students at Shawmut School, your friends and neighbors where you live, your colleagues at work. Let us share the love and grace of God with everyone and everywhere. Go in peace. Amen. me